Some say history is a river that flows endlessly. I say that history is a series of stories written by each person's experiences. Welcome to Stories, a history of Appalachia, one story at a time. It's crime time on Stories this week, folks. Hi, I'm Steve Gelly, along with Rod Mullins, and on this episode of the podcast, we're going to make a trip up to Logan, West Virginia, at least in cyberspace, to tell the story of Mamie Thurman. I like that theme, crime time. You know, we need us mm-hmm. a little sounder that kind of goes along with that, but <laughs> not too much law and order-ish, okay? But still. Well, who was this Mamie Thurman that we're getting ready to talk about here? Well, she was born in Kentucky on February 12th, 1900, and she and her husband Jack moved to Logan in 1924, and immediately she began attracting all kinds of attention. I'm afraid to ask what kind of attention, but I'm going to leave that up to you. Why don't you just tell us what she did? You're going to see, and it's not all that great, but yeah, there you go. You see, while Mamie maintained a quiet uh, church-going persona during the day, even working at the Nybert Memorial Church, when she went out at night, she became a rather flashy woman who liked to dress in tight dresses, wear bright red lipstick, and put on lots and lots of makeup. Now, Mamie Thurman became a sex-crazed beauty who was a regular at a place called the Amour Club, a speakeasy and house of prostitution, and there, Rod, she indulged herself and eventually got herself killed. My mother would call a woman like this a Jezebel. Hmm, yep, I've heard that term before. So that kind of sums it up right there. She was a Jezebel, but let me just tell you, there were rumors around town, probably true, that Mamie was sleeping around with at least, yeah, she had a scorecard, folks, at least a dozen or so prominent Logan men. And Jack was unaware since he was a Logan police officer who worked the night shift, the very time that Mamie would put on her sexy outfits and go out and party. Oh, Gosh, the heavens about this. Well, the Thurmans lived in an apartment there in Logan that was owned by a couple in town named Harry and Louise Robertson. Mamie and Jack's landlord, Harry, was a well-respected banker in town, as well as a member of the Logan City Commission. I've got a feeling this is going somewhere, Steve. You you can tell, can't you? Okay, (laughs) yeah. (laughs) And the Thurmans and the Robertsons soon began getting together socially and becoming good friends. Oh, and so did Mamie Thurman and Harry Robertson. Yep, just what I thought, too. Very, very, very good friends. Well, by 1930, the two began running around on their respective spouses, aided by a black man named Clarence Stevenson. Stevenson, you see, lived in Harry's attic and worked around the house for him, mowing, weeding, doing other odd jobs, in addition to caring for the Robertson's hounds, which he would take to Harry's fox hunts for him. And now he had a new job, driving Ms. Mamie to her rendezvous with Harry Robertson in his Model A Ford. Well, for two years, things went off without a hitch. Neither Jack Thurman nor Louise Robertson suspected a thing. Well, that is until the spring of 1932. Well, on June 21st, 1932, a deaf-mute teenager, Garland Davis, was out on Trace Mountain just outside Logan, West Virginia, picking blueberries. As the boy came up to a drainage ditch, a blood-stained blue polka dot dress was spotted. It was Mamie Thurman. Mamie had two bullets in her head, her neck was broken, her throat slashed ear to ear, and her face battered. At the same time, her purse was still there with $9 and her wristwatch in it, and she still had her diamond engagement ring and her wedding band on her finger. Whoever did this didn't do it for the money. He or she wanted her to be hurt before she died. As soon as Mamie's body was found, the first place the police looked was the Robertson house. There they found bloodstains in the Model A that Clarence used to show for Mamie to her meetings with Harry. Blood was also found on rags in the basement of the home, as was a razor. Now the police arrested both Harry Robertson and Clarence Stevenson and took them off to the local jail. At a preliminary hearing, Harry told all in his testimony... He described his sexual dalliances with Mamie, saying that he would tell his wife that he and Clarence were going off fox hunting, then load their guns into the Model A and head off to meet Harry's lover. Harry also told the court of a list that Mamie had given him containing the names of 16 Logan area men with whom she had been intimate. Harry disclosed that of those 16, one was dead, 
13 lived in Logan, and all were married except for one. Well, the names on the list were never revealed. There were rumors, though, that many of the men on the list were named to the grand jury. Robertson also testified that the last time he saw Mamie was the day she was killed. According to him, he left his house shortly after seeing her to take his children to a swimming pool at Stallings. Later that evening, he went to the smokehouse to listen to a prize fight with his son and was home about 9 o'clock. His wife later confirmed his statement. Well, in September, the grand jury, now this is the same one rumored to have been filled with Mamie's lovers, issued indictments against Clarence Stevenson, but not against his boss, Harry Robertson. So Harry went free, and Clarence was put on trial for Mamie's murder. Convenient for the time, I'm sure. And what a trial it was. An investigation turned up links between the deceased Mamie and several of Logan's most prominent citizens. So the trial became a must-see event. Sort of like must-see TV, Mm -hmm. but still, it was a must-see event. And the courtroom became standing room only, with many of those in attendance to watch bringing their own comfy chairs and packing lunch. Can you believe this? You know, we've we've seen things like this in other areas, like hangings. Um, I suppose before the head TV, this probably was the most entertainment you could get in town. This was like a 30s version of the O.J. Simpson trial. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, seriously, it's what it reminds me of. Well, at trial, the blood evidence was introduced, and witnesses came forward saying that they'd seen Clarence driving near where the body had been discovered. And how did they know it was Clarence Stevenson? Well, Roddy had a distinctive look about him, since he was very short, less than five feet tall, and had facial deformities due to a car accident he'd been in. Ironically, the accident not only left him with scars on his face, it also caused him to suffer from nosebleeds, which could have explained the blood on the rags and in the Model A. In addition, a parade of defense witnesses accounted for Clarence's whereabouts for the entire day that Mamie was killed. The jury, however, didn't care about that. After less than an hour, the jury came back with a guilty verdict against Clarence Stevenson, even though he forcefully maintained his innocence. I have no knowledge of the crime I am accused of. I tried to tell the truth. I hope the law won't stop until they find the guilty party. Local churches got in touch with the NAACP to raise funds for an appeal, but the appellate court upheld the trial court. Clarence developed stomach cancer and died in prison on April 24, 1942. Well, over the years, there's been a lot of speculation on who was really responsible. If Clarence was, as he maintained, completely innocent, Louise Robertson was one suspect, as was her husband, Jack Thurman, although Jack was ruled out because he was working in another part of the town at the time of the murder. Now, many have also pointed to a setup, maybe by the Ku Klux Klan, who certainly would have been upset over Mamie Thurman having sex with a black man, which was rumored to have happened. Nobody really knows what happened that night. And, Rod, guess what else? Tuh. I don't know. I I would say it has something to do with a ghost, Steve, more than Mm, anything. You are psychic. (laughs) Ooh, okay. To this day, there are stories that Mamie's ghost is still seen, dolled up in that blue polka dot dress and the red lipstick and makeup, hitchhiking, hiding out in abandoned cabins, or walking aimlessly along the roads near Trace Mountain. Is she hanging out with a mothman too, by chance? <laughs> we'll no, never I mean, know. I don't know. I don't know. But I mean, I've kind of figured that was going to be something along there. But, you know, this is still, even though Clarence was convicted over this, this is still in, in one way, I guess it's a, it's almost an unsolved mystery out of this, isn't it? Well, yeah, it is. It's possible that Clarence did this, but he did have an alibi and just probably even better alibis than some of these other people. So I I don't know. Somebody wanted her dead. Interesting. Very interesting. And that's the story of the lady in the blue polka dot dress. Another story that makes up the history of this place we call home, Appalachia. Thanks for listening. You can subscribe to the podcast at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, or on your favorite podcast app. We're on Facebook at Stories of Appalachia and on Twitter at Story Appalachia. Again, thanks for sharing your ears with us. Till next we meet, so long, everybody. 